Well, grab your Bibles, if you have them, to the letter of James, chapter 3. James, chapter 3, we'll be looking at the first 12 verses together. As you make your way there in your Bibles, we're continuing to take a look at the marks of spiritual maturity and, and genuine faith. And as we consider these marks week after week, uh, our prayer is that they would be both an encouragement and a challenge to our faith, that they would encourage our faith as we read these marks and consider the fact that we see them evident in our lives and say, yeah, my faith is genuine. Yes, I, I'm walking in accordance with, will, with God's will and God's word, but that these marks would also challenge our faith and say, yeah, I want to continue to grow. I want to continue to mature. I want to reach spiritual maturity as I'm conformed into the image and the likeness of Jesus Christ. At our church, we're not just interested in seeing uh, new people come to faith in Christ. That's a wonderful thing. It's a great celebration, but we also want to see people grow and mature and be marked by these marks of spiritual maturity. If I could give you just a review of what we've been talking about and catch you up to chapter three. In chapter one, we talked about the, the mark of being joyful in trials. We talked about the mark of being victorious over temptation, being doers and not just hearers of the word. When we turned the page to chapter two, we talked about other marks as well, the mark of overcoming the sin of partiality. Uh, with our love one for another, that we wouldn't favor one person over another, but in our love, we would treat each other uh, in a way that honors God. As Christ has treated us, we should treat others. And then last time, if you were with us in the second half of chapter two, we talked about the mark of, of faith that works. We said that faith alone saves. And we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, but a faith that saves is, is never alone. We talked about the evidence of our faith at work in our lives. Well, as we turn to the page now to chapter 3 in the first 12 verses, we're going to talk about the next mark, which is uh, a taming the tongue, a tongue that is tamed. Uh, and so what we're going to talk about today is the fact that if Jesus is truly Lord of our, li our life and we profess that as believers, then it would also be reflected in the fact that he's Lord over our lips. And so we're going to talk about how we are instructed in chapter 3 to make Jesus Lord of our lips, not just of our lives. So chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, we'll be reading all the way to verse 12 together. It says, My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body, Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Uh, look, look also at ships. Although they are so large and driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder, wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member, and it boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature and it is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no man can tame the tongue. <clears throat> it's an unruly evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. The spring, does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh. The word of the Lord. If you're here and you've ever struggled to control your tongue... This is a helpful reminder for us. If you're here and you've ever said anything that you've regretted after you said, or as it was coming out of your mouth, you immediately regretted, or how you said something, these are helpful reminders for us. And a reminder that if Jesus is truly Lord of our life, we would see it reflected in the fact that he is Lord of our lips. And we see the instruction and through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that James gives and and, and the instruction that we're given is, is by means of, of exercising accountability before God for what we say and what we don't say. How do we make Jesus Lord of our lips? By exercising accountability for what we say and what we don't say. 
Uh, as James develops this idea in the first two verses, he begins by referring to his readers as my brethren. And there's a reason for that. He's speaking to believers. He often refers to them as my brethren. He sometimes refers to them as my beloved brethren. And it's a reminder, James is talking to believers, not unbelievers, and he's encouraging them in their faith. He's challenging them in their faith. He desires to see them live a life where Christ is not just Lord of their life, but Lord over their lips. But James knows that they're struggling to control their tongue. James knows that there may be times, just like us, where they've regretted what they've said. Nevertheless, just because we struggle to control our tongue doesn't mean that we cannot overcome the temptation to lose control. If you were with us back in chapter 1, we talked about one of those marks, which was uh, overcoming temptation or being victorious over temptation. And that includes when it comes to our tongue. We're often put in certain situations where we would think to ourselves, yeah, that's not really consistent with what I usually say, but there are certain circumstances, hardships, difficulties, the way we react to certain people or different things that may show what's really in our hearts by what we say. Now, James is talking to believers, right? Now, when you talk to an unbeliever, some of the things they say should surprise you, but it shouldn't surprise you when you consider what is consistent with how an unbeliever speaks. When an unbeliever slanders, when an unbeliever gossips, when, a, when an unbeliever uh, is overly critical in an ungodly way, that shouldn't be surprising, right? After all, it's consistent with an unbeliever. But when you see a believer who professes, yes, Jesus is my Savior and my Lord. Jesus is Lord of my life. And then it's not reflected in the fact that he's not Lord of their lips. You see an inconsistency, right? And it should not just surprise us, it should concern us. How much more you or I? Right? I confess, Jesus is my Lord. He's Lord of my life. But there are times when I say things and I notice that what I'm saying is not consistent with my profession that Jesus is Lord of my life. So how I say things and what I say should be reflected in the fact that I'm a slave of my Lord Jesus Christ. And I am accountable not just for how I live, but especially for what I say. James is speaking to believers. He's speaking to all of us. He knows they stumble from time to time and he knows they struggle, but he desires for them to overcome and to make Jesus Lord over their lips. So he calls them my brethren. Then he gives them the warning and he says, let not many of you become teachers. Why? Well, because all of us are accountable for what we say, but when it comes to teachers, there is a greater accountability. There's a greater influence, so there's a greater accountability. James knew that those who he was writing to in their day and age uh, saw the role of a teacher as a respected role. And there were some who desired that role or desired to be in that position, uh, not for the sake of service, but for the sake of status. So there were individuals who say, I want to be a teacher for the sake of, of the status it provides me, not necessarily because I'm called or because I'm qualified. And James says, not let, let not many of you become teachers. He doesn't say that because the role of teacher is something he's being critical of, but he wants to protect the role of the teacher uh, or the preacher. And James himself is a teacher, as we're going to see him identify himself here. And so he says, let not many of you become teachers. Teachers, why? Because we will receive a stricter judgment. Who is James referring to in the we? He's talking about himself. He says, I'm a teacher. I've been called to teach the word. We get this, this letter that he writes, um, and we know he's writing through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And so James is saying, teachers have a greater accountability. I'd like to suggest this is speaking, of course, to, about teachers in the church. It might be a pastor or a teacher. It also might be a, a teacher of a small group or a Bible study. But if you're here today and you would have spiritual influence in the life of another as a husband or a father, it's talking about you. If you're here today as a parent, as a father or a mother, this is talking about you. And there's a greater accountability that we have when it comes to teaching our children when it comes to leading our families. And so it's important that when we study the word and share the word, of course, when it comes to teachers and preachers in the church, but also our influence in the lives of others, when we're sharing the word or answering questions for individuals, 
I want to make sure I'm ready and I want to make sure I'm prepared. When someone asks me a question, maybe an unbeliever, and they say, well, what does the Bible say about this? Or what do you Christians say about this? Uh, and I don't know. It's good for me to say, I don't know. But let me get back to you. Let me follow up with you because I want to rightly divide the word of God. And there may be times where you say, I, well, I can't find that scripture. I don't know where that is. But we want to exercise accountability before God for what we say and Teachers will receive a stricter judgment. Now, I'd like to give you three reasons why teachers will receive a stricter judgment because the more we say, the more we are accountable for, right? The more we speak, the more we have to exercise accountability for what we speak. I want you to think about those professions where people speak for a living and how we tend to be more critical of those professions. Politicians, lawyers, pastors. <laughs> when you think of those individuals who speak for a living, what do you think of politicians? Well, we don't usually have a, a, good, um, a good, good view of them simply because they've, they can use their words to influence people in the wrong direction or, or not speak truths. It might be the same for lawyers. It might be the same for pastors. But the truth of the matter is there are good politicians and bad politicians. There are good lawyers and bad lawyers. There are good pastors and there's bad pastors. But the more we speak, the more we have an accountability before God for what we say. Um, the more we speak, it's also a reminder the more there's a need for a consistency in our speech that not only we would talk the talk, but that we would walk the walk. Now, for me as a teacher, as a preacher, my definition of success is not necessarily what you say in regards to how I'm living w in relationship to what I teach, but my definition of success is what those closest to me say about how I'm living consistently with what I teach and what I preach. John Maxwell, he once said, um, um, when it comes to true success, for him, true success is when those who know you the best love and respect you the most. When you think of those in your life who know you the best, do they love and respect you the most? Because that's what matters in the end. And my test of true success as a pre preacher and as a teacher, if you're a parent in the room as a teacher of your children, is really dependent not on what happens overnight, but what happens over the course of years and decades. As our children grow up and grow older, and they know us well, do they love us, love and respect us the most? If you want to know what my level of success is, it would probably be um, checking in with my wife, who I know the best and who knows me the best, and she knows whether or not I'm not just talking the talk, but walking the walk. And I might think I preach the best sermon on Sunday, and I get home and I don't want to take out the trash. <laughs> she might see an inconsistency present there. And so it's important that uh, we know that teachers have, have a greater accountability because the more they speak, the more the need to be consistent in, in what they say. And then thirdly, the more we speak, the more we're expected to teach the truth and not just our opinion. As teachers, we're not simply to say what we want you to hear or what we think is best, but what the word of God has to say. Um, in Second uh, Timothy 4, it says, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching for a time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of the evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Teachers are first and foremost accountable to God. Now, the people may say, hey, I want to hear more of this. I want to hear more of that. You know, I like a little bit of that or I like a little bit more of this and the teacher and preacher says, well, I'm accountable to the Lord and I'm going to teach the whole counsel of God in season and out of season when it's popular and when it's not, when it itches your ears and when it really challenges you. And that's the same for a parent, right? You have to tell your children some tough truths sometimes and they don't want to hear it. 
We've got toddlers. You tell them, no, you're not having candy for breakfast. They just throw a big fit like it's a terrible thing that they can't do. But you tell them, I know what's best for you. There's so much more when it comes to teachers and preachers. If you have any spiritual influence in the life of another, we don't speak what they want to hear. We don't want to just itch their ears or flatter them. We want to speak truth. We're not, our obligation as believers is not to tell people what they want to hear, tell people what they need to hear and to tell the truth of what God's word has to say. And so uh, why are teachers more accountable? Well, we get to see here um, the more you speak, the more accountability you have. And then he, he gives this reminder in chapter ver- 3, verse 2. It says, for uh, we all stumble in many things. Now, pastors and teachers have more of an opportunity to stumble in terms of what they say. Um, I, I was watching a, an old message one time, and I saw when I greeted everybody at the beginning, I said, uh, thank you for worshiping us this morning. I meant to say, thank you for worshiping with us. And didn't notice at the time, <laughs> but there's a big difference there. You got someone walking in and say, whoa, what is this church about? Thank you for coming and worshiping us. No, thank you for worshiping with us. We, we have a greater accountability. We have a more opportunity to, to stumble. The more you speak, the more accountability you have. The text goes on to say, if anyone does not stumble in word, he's a perfect man. Now, it's a reminder. We all stumble. We all struggle. But when we're talking about a perfect man, we're, we're talking about pursuing spiritual maturity. Now, perfection is not something we can reach in this life, sinless perfection, but we can pursue spiritual maturity. And our desire is that it would be reflected in our life that Jesus is Lord of our life and Lord over our lips, that we would be marked by genuine faith in this regard, that our tongue would be tamed, that the more we go about our lives and we have conversations with others and we are put in difficult circumstances, the less we would regret what we would say because we're, we're quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. And we model that in our lives, or at least we should. Um, and so it's important that we reflect that he's a perfect man, also able to bridle his whole body. And so it's a reminder. Uh, we are to exercise accountability before God for what we say, but also what we don't say. There are certain things that we need to say, and that might be a sin of omission on our behalf where we need to say something, but we didn't say something. And other times when uh, we say too much or say it in the wrong way. So make Jesus Lord over your lips by means of exercising accountability for what you say and don't say and what I don't say and what I uh, say. If I could give it just practical ways to do that, the first would be this, exercise accountability before God through prayer, through prayer. Um, uh, In the Psalms, we get to read what that looks like. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing, be acceptable, excuse me, in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. I need to exercise accountability every day. When I wake up, I need to begin my day and say, Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you because I'm prone to stumble. I'm prone to wander. Lord, I feel it prone to leave the God I love. Have you felt that, that pull in the wrong direction? And so I need to prepare myself. I need to exercise accountability. Uh, Psalm 139, 23 to 24, the psalmist says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. Lord, I want you to guard my tongue in terms of how I live and how I speak. I just don't want to live for you. I want my lips to reflect how I worship you and glorify you and and honor you. You know, we may say things sometimes that may not be good or bad, but just may be a waste. And sometimes we just waste our words. Be be quick to listen, slow to speak, and, and slow to wrath. And something we need to remember again and again. And sometimes we, I don't know about you, sometimes you say, you know, I know I shouldn't say this right now, but... I say it anyway. That's a point where you say, I'm just going to stop myself right there. Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you. And so exercise accountability before God through prayer. Secondly, exercise accountability before God through Christian community. Ephesians is a, a letter that's written to the church, the church at Ephesus. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, 
but only what's helpful for bringing others up according to their needs in, in Christ Jesus. I often say the, the term unwholesome talk there is the term for rotten fruit. And so when it comes to our relationships, the words we use matter. How we speak to others matter. And what can end up happening sometimes in a marriage, in a family, in a church is that there is a stench. There's some rotten fruit that you can smell and you see the, the flies starting to circle around. And it's a reminder, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. If it's not helpful for building up and encouraging, don't even say it. You know, our, mom, our mama say, right? If you have nothing good to say, don't say anything at all, just wonderful advice. And our church community is an opportunity to hold us accountable and a place where we can continue to, to pursue sanctification in terms of what we say and, and what we don't say. Thirdly, exercise accountability before God through biblical instruction. Uh, the Bible says that there are different gifts given to the church and some of those gifts in Ephesians 4, 11 to 13 are, are apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastors and teachers. If you take a look at the primary function of those four roles within the church from the early church to now, now you have evangelists, teachers, and preachers still functioning today. Their primary ministry was teaching. And this is a reminder of the importance of having teachers or preachers who rightly divide the truth of Scripture and rightly divide the Word of God. It's important for us to be Bereans and it's important not, uh, not only for us to be a part of a church that values God's word and expositional teaching or if we go verse by verse or ch chapter by chapter or even teach topically that we would see the context of the text behind the text and we would do that well but we would also um, know how to divide the scriptures ourselves. It's important not just to come and be fed but be able to to study scripture for yourself and say, hey, how do I get the most out of my Bible? How do I go about an inductive study method? You know, as I take a look at the text and I just meditate on, I read it. Maybe you read it again and again and again, and that can be a blessing to you. You can read a, a letter like James, five chapters, and just read it over and over again. Or read one chapter and read it over and over again. And you begin to see the truths therein. You see the bigger picture of the entire uh, letter. And you get start, start to pull out different pieces. And then you, you go through the process of observing and then properly interpreting and then applying the text. And maybe checking out other scriptures as well where the, that finds. So it's important that we were able to rightly divide scripture. Um, Ephesians 4.11 says this. He himself gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. As the word is taught, as it's preached and proclaimed, the purpose is that the people of God would not just be smarter Christians, but that they would be equipped to go and serve in the work of ministry inside the church walls and outside the church walls. As you come under the instruction of scripture, that you're better fathers and better mothers, better husbands and better wives, uh, more godly and, and more effective as disciples, going and inviting others to believe in Jesus, to belong to a church and to become more like Christ. And that's what we should be about as believers. Edifying the body of Christ. Do we all come to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So the primary function of a pastor or a teacher, they can do many things, but the most important thing is teaching and preaching the word of God as the people are equipped till they all come to a place of, of, of spiritual maturity and unity and are all focused on Christ and we're all moving in the right direction. We're all unified, not around a personality, not around an idea, but around scripture and God's word. He gave us a great commission. Go and make disciples of all nations. Now, we're the followers of, of Jesus Christ. And so that's just a, a wonderful picture there. If I could open up for discussion real quickly. How has God helped you or taught you to better control your tongue as a believer? How has God taught you or, or helped you better control your tongue as a a believer. What has God used in your life? Any tools that have been helpful? Yeah. You learn from your mistakes. 
yeah, yeah, yeah. Put a better guard on my tongue or the way I say it matters too, right? Yeah, yeah. So past mistakes help us correct our way. I'm not going to make that mistake again or hopefully I won't make that mistake again. Yeah. What else? Yeah, Stan. Oh, yeah, yeah. And you know it was sourced. Yeah, yeah. When your children tell you back what you've said, certainly. Where'd you learn that from you? Oh, that's not good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> good brothers, good brothers. Yeah. Anything else? What else the Lord has helped Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, godly examples of what a controlled tongue looks like. What it looks like to build up instead of tear down and to edify one another, certainly. Anything else? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just don't be sorry. Make a difference. Make a change. Yeah. Yeah, and as we're going to see, the, the tongue is difficult to tame. It's impossible to tame in our, our human ability, but of course, possible to change it by the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Any, anything other? Anything else helpful in ways that the Lord has taught you or continues to teach you to to control your tongue? You learn through different experiences, certainly. Yeah, and Christian community too. Hopefully we, we can, in a loving way, correct one another or encourage one another to uh, be edifying and uplifting. Um, difficult circumstances, hardships, often expose areas of our life that, or of our heart that we didn't know was there, right? And um, if you wanna know what's in your heart, consider what you say when you're under pressure or how you react under pressure. And often those who know you best, right, if you're married, a spouse, uh, maybe a close friend, they, they kind of know you pretty well. And it's always, I think, a, a good thing to say, hey, how am I doing with my tongue? Um, if you could say, hey, how, how, can, how can I uh, be a better steward of the tongue that God has given me? That's a difficult question to ask. If you're married, that's a hard thing to ask your spouse. Like, how am I doing in terms of speaking words that edify and uplift you instead of tear you down? How can I build you up better? And I can imagine your spouse can give you a pretty good answer. I can imagine if you have children, your children might be able to give you an answer as well. And so uh, take time in humility to perhaps turn to someone you love and who loves you and is open and transparent enough to hold you to account and say, how am I doing? And how can I continue to make Jesus Lord over my lips. So exercise accountability for what you say. And then thirdly, recognize, secondly, recognize the power of the tongue. Recognize the power of the tongue. As we read verses three to eight, we get to see that the power of the tongue is powerful. It's powerful enough to direct our lives. It's power enough, powerful enough to destroy our lives. It's powerful enough to direct us in the right direction and, and, and powerful to lead us in the wrong direction. And if you've ever experienced the destruction that comes with a, a tongue that is not controlled, uh, you know the, the warning that we get to read about. Um, James, beginning in verse 3, is a master illustrator. He uses these illustrations to tell us about the, powerful, the, of the power of the tongue to direct our lives, beginning in verse 3. And uh, he speaks of, of leading a horse. Verse, verse 3 says, Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us. A bit is very small. You put it in a horse's mouth. It's used for training the horse and leading it in the direction you want it to go. And so it steers your horse in the direction you need it to go. The tongue is small. 
And yet it will steer you in the right direction or the wrong direction. It can lead you on a path to destruction and death or lead you down a path to blessing and life. Based on what we say, our words are powerful and they can, they can lead us in, in the direction. If you've ever been in an interview <laughs> and you've had to interview with somebody, you know what you say and how you say it matters, how you give your answers. If you've ever had to make a good first impression to somebody, you know what you say or how you say it matters. If you are in a difficult place and you have to confront somebody, we all have to confront individuals at times or be confronted at times, it's, it's, it's going to direct that relationship. It might lead that relationship down a bad path or it might lead that relationship down the right path, right? And so, um, indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their, their whole body. So something very small, but something powerful enough to guide and direct something in the right direction or the wrong direction. So a bit in a horse's mouth, but also to guide and, and direct a ship. The text goes on to say in verse 4, Look also at ships, although they are so large and driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Now, this was written in a day and age where their ships are not as big as they are today. I mean, have you ever looked at these carnival ships? Just gigantic, humongous. I mean, you've got thousands and thousands of people. It's like a small city on the ocean. And yet, as this giant ship is, is, is going different places through storms, through big waves and storms, just a little rudder to turn the whole ship and to guide it in one direction. And it's a reminder that's just a little rudder, but it matters who's in control and who's driving the ship. And the question is, who's driving your ship? Who's in control of your tongue? And sometimes we might say, I didn't, I didn't know that was in me. Or that, that's not really consistent with who I am. But the reality is those hardships, those pressures actually revealed what was deep in. And you realize there are areas of my heart that God's still working on. There are th places that God needs to cut off in my heart. And so, Lord, you know, uh, examine my heart. If there's any wicked way in me, lead me in the path of everlasting. Guide me in your path and help me to do the hard work of, of getting rid of the things that shouldn't be there. So who's driving uh, your ship? Uh, a small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Verse five, even so the tongue is a, a little member and boasts great things. It's small, but it can make a big difference. It's small, but it can make a big difference in, in our marriages. It's small, but it can make a big difference in the lives of our children. What we say to our children as they grow up, doesn't matter when they're really young or growing up older or even out of the house, what you say to your children can make a big difference. When it comes to your marriage, right? What you say to your spouse Matter. It can make a big difference. It can make a world of difference, whether you're investing in positive things or, or negative things. You know, sometimes you can be with uh, somebody in the room and you know they're not getting along. Could be uh, a, a married couple. It could be a couple friends. And then you see not just their body language, but how they speak to each other. And you can tell pretty quickly, okay, listen, this, things aren't going to go on the right path because until either one of them humbles themselves and is really willing to, to speak words that edify and build up instead of tear down, I think we, we're not going to go anywhere. And so communication, we, we all know how to communicate, right? We know how to communicate. You speak and then I speak. No, speaking and listening, and you should listen more than you speak. And as you listen more than you speak and you're slow to wrath, slow to, slow to speak, then you get to see what needs to happen. And so um, we see the power of the tongue to direct. Secondly, the power of the tongue to destroy. It's like a little spark that can spread like wildfire. Text goes on to say in verse six, and the tongue is, a f uh, or second part of verse five, excuse me. See how great a forest, a little fire kindles. Just a little spark. We're, we live in Oregon, so we understand this. You just drive down the McKinsey Highway and you can see what a, a little spark can do to destroy a, a forest and it spreads like wildfire. Just some wind that takes that little spark and it spreads 
very quickly. That's the tongue. It's a reminder of the power of gossip. You just say a little whisper. In the Greek, it's gaskusmas. Sounds like it sounds like gossip. Gaskusmas, gaskusmas. And you get to hear the little whispers going around. It could be in a church. It could be in the workplace, wherever it may be. And man, that gossip can spread like wildfire and destroy a reputation. A little bit of slander can destroy somebody. When it comes to the words, you, you might speak to your children. Instead of building up and tearing them down, man, it can destroy their lives. You never tell your child, hey, I'm proud of you or I love you. And they grow up their entire lives thinking or trying to please their father, even if they're still not there. I remember talking to a gal at my last church in her 80s and still feeling the pain of her father, never telling her he was proud of her, never telling her he loved her and it still affected her to the day that I was talking to her. Words are powerful and they're powerful to destroy like a spark. It can spread like wildfire. Verse six says, in the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity that defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature and it is set on fire by hell. I love what Chuck Swindoll says about this in terms of a world of iniquity. James is saying that the full range of iniquity finds an outlet through the tongue. It's virtually impossible to seethe with anger without expressing our rage in words. Bitterness sours our speech. Pride prattles on and on. Hate explodes from the lips. The tongue can suddenly turn an otherwise gentle person into a monster. It's a world of iniquity. Have you ever seen somebody who's just very calm? Then you say something and it triggers something in them and they explode on you. Sometimes it's transference, like somebody had a bad day at work. <laughs> you come home and you say something or do something, they just explode on you. You're like, where did that come from? World of iniquity, right? And the tongue just goes off on the wrong person because it should have been that person or this situation, but you pour it out on the wrong person and you just explode or, or you, you never communicate about something. You just bottle it in, bottle it in, bottle it in and all of a sudden you lose control. You don't have any control over your emotions. You don't have any control over your anger and uh, you have unresolved conflict and, and it expresses itself in a world of iniquity, not just how we act towards one another but what we say to one another. Not just what we say to one another, what we don't. Say, it's a world of iniquity. Um, text goes on to say, um, for every kind of beast and bird, reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. And so what we're told is it has the power to destroy like a little spark that spreads like wildfire, but it's also something that can't be tamed by human means. This is important for us to understand because when it comes to your tongue, you can't try to do better next time without the power of the Spirit. This is a reminder, as Christians, we should look different than the world in terms of how we speak or what we say or what we don't say. We can come up with excuses, right? You know, you made me say that. I wouldn't have said that if you didn't make me <laughs> say it. Or we make excuses like, you know, my father spoke that way. My grandfather spoke that way. And so I just speak that way. It's just in my genes. It's just who I am. No, if you're in Christ, you're a new creation. The old has passed away. All things, behold, have become new. We're new in Christ. And so we should see the fruit of that on our lips and how we speak. And so it's important that we don't continue to make excuses. Listen, take a look at animals. You can tame them. Uh, your pet dog, you know, you can teach it and you can train it. But when it comes to the tongue, it cannot be tamed. It's a world of iniquity. It's set on fire by hell. And so when it, you think about the destruction that the tongue brings, uh, the, the process in which it, it, it destroys is from hell. It's from Satan. It's the purposes of, not of God, but of Satan, and it's, it's set on fire by hell. And the word for hell there is the word Gehenna, and it was an actual location in Jerusalem. In the, the, the southern part of Jerusalem, you had the garbage dump in the Hinnom Valley. 
and they just burn the trash there. And so the picture here is, is what the tongue does. I mean, it destroys. You think about the Hinnom Valley. If you go to the dump, the, the trash dump, and you can smell the, the nasty trash burning, that's the stench that it brings. I don't want that in my marriage. I don't want that in my family. I don't want that in my church. I don't want gossip and slander and, and, and ungodly talk or, or uncontrolled speech or, or reacting like I shouldn't. Saying something and I know I shouldn't say it or, or I know I should say it in love and, and grace or, you know, before I go into the conversation, Lord, help me. You ever been there, right? Like you might have a conversation with your spouse and say, oh, Lord, you're gonna have to help me say this the right way. I'm going to have to have a, a difficult conversation with a child. I need to correct them. I need to discipline them. I need to point them to scripture and say, hey, this is what God's word says. Whom, whom the Lord loves, he disciplines just as the father and the son in whom he delights. I delight in you, son. I delight in you, daughter. And so I need to, need to, to speak to you these words. And so it's important that we, we think about those things. And then it says in verse 8, um, Verse 9, excuse me, uh, with it we bless our God and Father, with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. And so, just a reminder, the, the tongue is powerful. We need to recognize that. It's the power to direct our lives in the right direction or the wrong direction. It has the, the power to destroy our lives, our, our marriages, our relationships, our, our influence, our effectiveness as disciples. How we speak matters. What we say matters matters and also what we don't say matters as well if I could give us just ways to recognize the power of the tongue the the first would be this guard against the destructive nature of the tongue Proverbs twelve eighteen says this there is one who speaks like the piercings of a sword words can pierce like a sword ever been pierced by a sword I haven't might have been cut one time by a knife. You accidentally cut yourself. Man, that's how words can cut. They can pierce. They hurt. But the tongue of the wise promotes health. Guard against the destructive nature of the tongue, knowing words hurt and words are powerful. You know the common phrase that children say, bricks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That's a lie, isn't it? Words will hurt you in places bricks can't reach. And although bricks will hurt you and then you might be able to recover and might be able to heal from it, there are certain, certain words that can wound a heart, can wound a person from a child as they continue to grow up for the rest of their lives. And it's a, a wound that just doesn't heal. You ever had a wound that, that just didn't have a scar over and didn't heal? You might have needed some extra help with it. I mean, that's how some walk around wounded by the words of others. Guard your tongue knowing how destructive your tongue and my tongue can be. Bricks and stones do break bones and so do words. Uh, secondly, admit your need for God's help. We need God's help. We can't do it on our own. Um, the power of the tongue is great, but the power of God is greater still. No matter how powerful your tongue may feel as if it's controlling you and controlling what you say, God's power is, is greater. And he's almighty. Admit your need for God's help. Ask for wisdom, when to speak up and when to remain silent. I love this quote by Abraham Lincoln. He once said, better to remain silent and be thought a fool than to speak and to remove all doubt. Someone once said, even a fish would not get in trouble if he kept his mouth shut. Any fishermen in the room, you understand that. Sometimes it's just good to be slow to speak, slow to wrath, quick to listen. How many arguments would that save us if we were just quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to wrath? And what a blessing that would be if we applied these principles to our lives. And then fourthly, rely on the power of the Holy Spirit to, to build up and, and not tear down with the tongue. God is the solution. The Spirit of God who, who dwells in us is the solution. Uh, Ephesians 5.18, don't be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but be ye filled with the Holy Spirit. There are times when you feel like you, you've lost control. You lose control of your temper and the tongue is a world of iniquity and it expresses itself through the tongue and it's, it's like poison and it just explodes. Listen, I, I, need to, I need to walk in the spirit so that I don't fulfill the lust of the flesh or the desires of 
the flesh. If I could open up for discussion at this point, when you think of words spoken to you growing up that have impacted your life as an adult in a good or bad way, what comes to mind? Words that, that still stick with you today when you think of words that were spoken, either positive or, or negative, when you think of the power of your words. Does anyone want to share? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Words can change your life. I do. I do. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. 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 How old were you? Four years old. Mom says God's going to use you. What encouragement to your faith, yeah. Yeah, anything else? They've impacted your life. They've shaped your life. Your decisions you make. Advice that you've been given. Yeah, Steve. Uh, just a brother in the Lord years ago. Uh, every time he'd come by your house to check on you, yeah. uh, his words would be, hey, brother, what's the Lord been teaching you? Yeah. So instead of him telling me what he knew, he wanted me to tell him what the God of heaven had been teaching me. Oh, yeah. Anyway, that always stuck with me. Yeah. Oh, amen. What's God teaching you? Yeah, there was a, a gal in her 80s or 90s. I think she was in her 90s. When you're young, you think everybody's, you know, maybe in their 80s or 90s. And I remember every time you would come up to her, she'd look you dead straight in the eyes and say, you know what? Jesus loves you. But she meant it. Meant it with every fiber, fiber of her being. And every time, she didn't want you to leave the conversation before she looked at you and said, Jesus loves you. And you that sticks with you. It sticks with you. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. Just something to consider. Thinking about some of those words that have shaped your life, whether from a parent or a mentor or a teacher. And think about whether it was a good impact or a negative impact. What kind of words are we speaking to the next generation? Uh, what words are we pouring into them or building into them? And so if I could ask that question, what do we need to be telling the next generation? What kind of words do we need to be, be speaking into their lives? What do they need to hear? It could be children. It could be youth. Yeah. Yeah, Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So talking about, uh, Marianne is talking about uh, what Easter is about, but the gospel, right? That's the essence of it. And whether you're four, three or four or five years old, you can understand the simplicity of the gospel. Um, and we should share it with others. She, Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anything else you'd say? We need to be speaking this into the, the lives of our kids or the youth, the next generation. Yeah. So this is something that in my 25 years of working with leadership. Oh, yeah. Drawn back into 
seems odd because the person was also at fault. So it's really been actually a powerful leadership lesson. Yeah. <laughs> So that group mentality and um, you're saying when it comes to failures, you, you take that on. And when it comes to successes, you don't hold on so tightly. You share that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Taking ownership, responsibility, accountability. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're hungry for truth. And I think the younger generation's hungry for a cause, like a mission, something to, to, to live for. I mean, you take a look at all the different, you know, things going on in college campuses. They're looking for some kind of purpose, something bigger than themselves, something you can fight for, right? And we got the gospel. We've got the, the uh, great commission to go and make disciples to the ends of the earth. Turn the world upside down for Christ. What greater opportunity is there than that? Join the local church and let's do it together. Yeah. If, if I could turn it around from speaking into the lives of children to speaking the lives of spouses, if I can do it from the wife to the husband, what do husbands need to hear? If, if there's husbands in the room, what words do you need to hear from your wife? Yeah, encouragement. Yeah. Affirmation. Sir. Anything else? What's helpful to hear, husbands, from your wives? Yeah, Joe. Take out the trash. Take out the trash. <laughs> Just that we need the reminder. We need the reminder. <laughs> I was wrong. I was wrong, okay. I was wrong. She's honest with you. Honesty, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, honesty and transparency. Steve, were you going to say something? Yeah, just sitting here tonight, I followed in their book. Uh huh. Wrote me a little note. And what she wrote in there was encouraging. Oh, yeah. That's what guys need to hear. Oh, yeah. Just a little note, a reminder of encouraging words. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Harold. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Prayer and the reminder I'm praying for you. Yeah. So good. Yeah. Yeah. Let's turn around. Wives. Wives. What do wives need to, to hear from their husbands? Now's your chance, okay? No. What do wives need to hear from their husbands? Baby, please forgive me. <laughs> I mean, seriously. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, forgiveness and humility to do that, yeah. yeah anything else? Yes, Nora. I have some friends who are really godly, wonderful people, and he has never in their entire marriage told her he's just beautiful. Yeah. And it hurts her. Yeah. So being told you're beautiful and I love you, yeah, sure. Yeah, Juliana. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, just from the word, just from the word. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 Re 
reassurance and just a reminder of the scripture. Be anxious about nothing. Pray about everything. And you're in it together. That's what it sounds like. Like you're not alone. We're, we're together. We'll bear this burden together. Yeah. Anything else? We, we have some folks, you know, who might be getting married soon, so that we need some advice here, all right? <laughs> yes, Dan. Nothing calms my wife's spirit like me asking her to pray with me about yeah. the thing that is bothering us with her. Yeah. Let's pray together about this. Yeah. All right. Well, so make Jesus Lord of your lips. Exercise accountability for what you say. Recognize the power of your words. And then lastly, fix the source of the problem. If you struggle to control your tongue, the key is fixing the source of the problem. Verse uh, 9, going back to it, says this. uh, To verse 12, it says, With it, we bless our God and Father. So we sing praises. We worship the Lord. We pray to him and say thank you for your goodness and your grace. And with it, we curse men. We speak words that we shouldn't to others who have been made in the similitude of God, created in the image of God. So it's just a reminder, hey, what are we saying about those who have been created in God's image? Um, Verse 10, so there's an inconsistency. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, speaking to believers, he knows they struggle here. He says, these things ought not to be so. We need to hear that. When it comes to blessing God and then cursing our brother, that should not be so. When it comes to inconsistency in our speech, that should not be so. That may be be, um, consistent with an unbeliever, but that's not consistent with a believer. When we're talking about pursuing spiritual maturity, when we're talking about being those who say, Jesus is Lord of my life, it should be reflected the fact that Jesus is Lord of my lips and I control my tongue. How do I control it? The fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5, 22 to 23. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and Self-control. I would say those last two are very relevant. Gentleness in how I speak. I think it's Colossians 3. It says, husbands, don't speak harshly to your wives. You shouldn't speak harshly to anybody, but especially our wives. There should be a gentleness with how we speak. Gentleness is power under control. I can, I, I can yell. I've got power behind my voice. But I need to speak gently with others. I need to control how I say things, but I need to control what I say and what I don't say. And tone has so much to do with what I, what I say and don't say as well. And so verse 11, this is the question. These things should not be so. So the question is, does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? That's a rhetorical question. The answer is no. You don't have bitter and fresh water coming out of the same spring. Um, Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? I recently bought a cherry tree, planted it in the front yard. And that thing, I'm waiting for it to grow. My wife told me if it grows, she might make me a a nice steak dinner or something. I don't know. But it's not growing very well. But we're going to find out whether or not it's truly a cherry tree or not as soon as the fruit comes. If it doesn't produce cherries, guess what? It's not a cherry tree. It might be a, it might produce plums, it might produce apples, but it's, but the kind of fruit will be reflected. Well, the kind of tree it is will be reflected on the kind of fruit that it bears. So if it's bitter water, you coming from a bitter source. If it's words that don't uplift, it's not coming from a heart that is fitting of 
one who claims to be a, a, a follower of Christ, one who submitted their life to the Lord in their lips. Thus, no spring yields both salt water and fresh water. So the point is this, fix the source. The source is our hearts and what needs to be changed is our heart. And so what is coming out of our mouths needs to be fixed in here. And so uh, practical ways to do that first, ask God to change your heart, not just your life. If Jesus is gonna change your life, it begins in your heart, and I, I need a heart change first. I need God to soften my heart. I need to humble myself in the sight of the Lord and say, yeah, Lord, I stumble. We all stumble from time to time. A perfect man is one who, who doesn't stumble um, and is able to bridle their whole body. If you wanna know if you exercise self-control in other areas of your Christian walk, take a look at your tongue and how you use your tongue. Because your tongue and how you control it will give you a good evidence where you're at in your um, walk with the Lord and your, and your um, uh, process of spiritual maturity and your process of sanctification. So ask God to change your heart, not just your life. Secondly, make Jesus Lord of your lips, not just your life. Well, when you're making him Lord of your life, right? You're making him Lord of your lips. But there's significance to what we say, right? Romans 10, 9, if we confess with our mouths Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. It's with the mouth you confess and are saved and with the heart you believe unto salvation. So words matter. It's part of the process by which we are, are justified. Yeah, we're justified by faith alone, but the expression of that is through the words that we speak. And so words matter. What we say matters. And then thirdly, ask God to reveal inconsistencies in your life. Um, I, I, just, I had a couple questions, but I'll just close with you just to think about them. When are those times when you lose control of your tongue? Think about those times. I, I often use the acronym for me, HALT. H-A-L-T, when I'm hungry, when I'm angry, when I'm lonely, and when I'm tired, I tend to lose control of my tongue. What are those times for you? For you, it might be on your way home from work. It might be on your way home from a, a doctor's appointment. It might be home, home or, or from a long day or a, a hard time. And you need to know, when are those times when you might lose control of your tongue? And ask the Lord to change your heart from the inside out and challenge you to change you. Don't just make Jesus Lord of your life. Make him Lord of your lips. Can we pray? Uh, Father, we're grateful for your word. Thankful for the mark of spiritual maturity and genuine faith of being able to tame the tongue. No man can tame the tongue, but you can through the power of your spirit that you've provided us. I pray, Lord, that you, we would use our words to build up and not tear down. I pray, Lord, right now that we can confess any sin in, in the ways that we have spoken to others in regards to speaking unwholesome talk that has come out of our mouths, that has poisoned our relationships or poisoned the people that we talk with, Lord. And I pray that we wouldn't poison others with the words that we would speak, but we would build them up, that we would point them to Christ and that we would speak words of life and not death. And I pray that that would uh, be a blessing in the marriages represented in the room and the families. I pray that that would be represented in the workplace and in the different conversations we have. And I pray, Lord, that that would be evident by how we declare the good news of the gospel of Christ to the lost around us and we would be faithful to do just that. Lord, change our hearts in ways that we need it and Father, challenge us to pursue spiritual maturity. We pray this all in Jesus' name, amen.